Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson, where we interview the world's highest quality communicators, professionals, business owners, creatives, and everything in between. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're a high quality communicator, there's a good chance you're living a lot happier life, but you're also bringing those opportunities into your life almost like a magnet. My guarantee is that on this show, we only interview people that I, one, look up to, and two, that I know are going to continue to kill the game for years to come, and I want to make sure they're on your radar. But what I've learned is by asking the best questions, we get the best responses, and that's what the highest quality communicators, our social sellers, are all about. Let's hop inside to the Social Seller Podcast. Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson. Today, we have a special guest. We are just going to hop right in. Sam... Thompson, thank you for being here. You are an incredible friend and someone I've looked up to for a long time. You're 24 years young. Appreciate it. You grew up in LA. You have started a handful of companies in the digital marketing realm. And I'm purposely going to just call it that umbrella because we are going to dive into what some of that looks like. You were one of the first friends that I made and Chris, the other business partner, right? I'm talking like six, seven years ago. We were all in college at the time you were at Boston University and it was all online. It was from the Instagram days to figuring out, all right, hey, whoa, we all value this marketing world and kind of living this freedom lifestyle, so to speak, or how can we help people online and, and kind of move and not be stuck in a place? And we all fell in love with that idea and concept. You have continued to take action. Right before we started this, this conversation, you know, you were an action taker. Thank you for being here, Sam. What brought you here today? You and your beautiful smile. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Uh, if anyone has the opportunity to meet Connor in person, I definitely recommend. He's a stunner. Um, but yeah, I'm always down to chat. Excited to to dive into, you know, we can talk about business, life, uh, you know, personal development, anything you, you really want. I love it. And let's hop right in because I know our conversations happen very naturally. Yeah. It's seamless. And I, I didn't write down many questions and that's feedback we've gotten from other interviews. So let's just see where the rabbit hole goes. But to start, what is the number one mistake you see millennials making today? Millennials being... Ah, oh, shoot, I forget the age range, but I'll say like right now, anyone from like 23 to 35 probably, what is the number one mistake you see in the world? Uh, a lack of focus on emotional IQ, right? A lot of people right now, I think, get caught up in the whirlwind that's life. Um, and I think that they let a lot of things happen to them and their emotional understanding of themselves is lacking. Um, I think a lot of people, once they can start to separate, you know, their identity from their emotions, uh, we'll, we'll start to see a lot of more positivity in their life, uh, a lot more opportunity. Um, there's just, there's a slew of benefits that come from paying attention to your emotions. And I think that that's not necessarily the sexy thing to do, the cool thing to do, all of that. The masculine but, thing to do. Right. Like, dude, I sit there and I used to do it all the time, like three times a day. I'd ask myself, what five emotions am I feeling right now? Right. And like, actually think about it. Why? Why am I feeling angry? What is causing this fear? Right. Like actually addressing it head on. And now it's second nature. Anytime an emotion comes up, I go, okay, that's not, that's not me. I'm experiencing this because of X, Y, or Z. And it makes it way easier for me to address it than lose myself in that moment of saying, oh my God, I'm so mad right now. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't even acknowledge that that's possible. Absolutely. One way you could take it is maybe presence, right? Yep. When you're in that moment, you can identify in the moment, why am I feeling this way? Why, why am I feeling good or why am I not feeling good? Yep. On the flip side, it does start to become second nature. A lot of it in meditation and spirituality from what I've learned is identifying the emotion and also identifying where are my thoughts, right? Because if emotion is just energy in motion, just like you're saying, it's starting to identify it. And it sounds a lot easier than I thought, right? It, this taken years of practice. For me, it was meditation. Right. You consciously, do you schedule something in your, your calendar? Um, is that what you did to get to that point? Yeah, so I, I would do, I'm not a big meditation guy. Um, I think. I'm glad you say that as too. a as a macro I think that there's a lot of people that hear words like meditation therapy all of those and there's some level of just discomfort with saying those words um, and so no not not a big like meditation I'm gonna do this 30 minutes of silence focus on my breathing you know type of situation um, I'm more I'm more focused on doing it a little bit more reactively um, and so two things one is that that five emotions question and there's this phenomenal app that everyone should download called universe of emotions and they map 35,000 emotions that humans can feel um, 
And what I would do is I'd basically pop in, you know, three times a day when I was eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, essentially. Look at that and kind of try to be like, okay, where am I standing right now, right? And they, they do it on a, it's like a X by Y chart. And so you have positive and negative, active and passive, right? Like active negative is rage, right? And you can start to really like understand the context of emotions a lot better just by knowing, oh, okay, that's what I'm feeling or that's how I identify it. And you start to give it a vocabulary that makes it way easier to have a conversation with yourself. Um, so that was maybe my form of, of meditation. I think I just, it's a little bit more of an active approach. The other, it's going to sound ridiculous. Let's hear it. Is I would keep a cup of water on my desk at all times. And any time that I started to feel an emotion, fear, anger, happiness, right? Any of those, I would look at the cup of water and just imagine an octopus in there. And I'd look at it and I'd say, cool, that is what anger looks like, right? That is what this is. It's moving around. It's this thing. And I think what it, it really did for me was started to make me, like I said at the beginning, not identify with it. I think a lot of people say like, I'm angry or I'm tired when really it's, I'm experiencing anger, temporary, right? Like yeah. I'm experiencing something. It doesn't make you, you're not an angry person. You're experiencing anger at that moment. And just by literally having a visual thing on my desk that I could focus on, I was like, bet that's there. And it helped me separate that a little bit more and handle it kind of more objectively with that emotion. Um, and then that progressed into uh, same cup of water. Anytime that I was feeling one of those emotions, I'd tap it and it'd create like a little ripple in the water. And I don't know how, but at, at some point it just, the moment that the water went flat, I was calm. I was okay. I was good. Um, and so those two things, like, honestly, as ridiculous as specifically the second one sounds, yeah um changed my life is like and now it's all like i don't have a cup of water on my desk anymore i just like do it subconsciously do you still um, visualize or see that cup of water not it not so much anymore mm -hmm. um it's like I, again i think when you do it so frequently because here's the crazy part i tap that thing of water like 40 times a day right like you feel a lot in life right like every text that you get can make you feel something every email every phone call just Anything you can say. Literally anything ever can make you feel something. Um, and essentially my, my goal with it was just get to a point where I was relatively unfazed. I could still acknowledge that I was feeling it. Um, but it didn't, it didn't impact my life, either in the positive or the negative. I wasn't, it, it wouldn't be like moment and then I'd have to like take five minutes of interrupting my day or inter interrupting that present moment to like address that emotion. Um, and now it's just, it's kind of just second nature. And like, I just stay, when you guys download Universe of Emotions, you'll see it, but there's a pocket that's semi-positive and semi-active, and you just try to stay there. That's when you feel inspired, motivated, uh, competent, confident, right? And that's that pocket. And over the last three or four years, I've just consciously been paying attention to pulling myself into that pocket all of the time. And now I'm, I'm relatively unfazed by anything that happens. I can always know that I'm, I'm okay. Like emotions come up, it happens. And I don't have to like change my life or change my day because you know, I saw the wrong piece of content this morning, right? Or like I turned on the TV and the news was there, like unfazed. Right. And we're, we're surrounded by fear. Mm-hmm especially when you're not equipped with this tool, tool set, right? Yeah. And we all have it. It's just starting to put more attention into it. Yeah. Um, I love that you say there's this baseline. And for you having that X, Y quadrant graph, I see that there's a sweet spot that you'd start to see. And for me, I see that too. I think of it more in like waves. Yeah. And I want these waves to be pretty, pretty mild, right? right. You know, the lake life in we, early uh, morning when no I one's on the water. Long, that's you know, Reef, Reef Coleman from yep. We Assist. Um, yeah. We'll put the link to yeah. Reef's interview right there. Reef's a, Reef's a homie. I had a, probably a 90 minute conversation with him talking about that piece, which is the boundaries. If you think of, if you're familiar with like math or calculus, you have like the sine and cosine waves, right? Yep. Where you have the standard and they can go, you know, positive, negative, all the way through. And a lot of people, to your point, 
have like pretty wide, right? Like if, if you say plus 10, negative 10, people can get to plus eight and negative eight and they always match, right? Like, and I've been blessed to have worked to be, I'm always in like this plus two, minus two, smaller wave. I'm not having huge upswings of emotion. I'm not having huge downswings, which like the conversation I have with Reef is like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because if you're if you handle yourself in a way that makes it so you can't feel the the super low moments, you also have to acknowledge that you're not going to be able to feel the depth of the great moments yeah. as much. I like stability. I like feeling in control. I like being present. And the wild swings up and down weren't conducive to me feeling that way. And so I, I knowingly made that sacrifice of like, I don't have a lot of moments every day, every week, month that like really excite me. Good things happen and I go, that's awesome. But I'm not like over the moon, but like bad things happen and I'm not like down and out for 24 hours because I'm sad, mad, angry, whatever. Um, And with those sad emotions too, you can have friends or people around you, it could be a family member that can look at you in awe, like, wait, why doesn't yep. this have this attachment? Yeah. To you? Why are you not that excited? Why are you not that sad? Yeah. Right? Like why, like, why do you not How, feel it not that way? The way you were. Like, right. And I go, I do feel it. Like I, I acknowledge that it's there. I'm not going to let it distract me from being present right now and handling what, whatever needs to be handed. Right. And it, it makes, I mean, relationships, family, all of that. Right. Like it's why people that have larger you know, sways of that emotion are attracted to people that don't because someone needs to be that solid piece. And I'm happy to be that. It's my comfort zone. It makes life for those that are a little bit more and not that it's a bad thing or a good thing. It just is what it is. Yeah. Makes it easier for them to have a conversation with me where like something bad happens and everybody in the room is hysterical. Like nothing is really going to happen than everyone just being hysterical. Right. Like there always needs to be that balancing force. And in a world where there's so much just emotional incline, decline all over, um, getting in control of your emotions and being able to stay very, very solid, uh, in your, in your range or in your quadrant. Um, yeah, it's life changing. It It, it really helps. It's the ingredients in the recipe to find happiness consistently. And that's the biggest thing, right? It's not that I love how you describe it because you're exactly right. It, there can be these huge swings and there's, there's passion in there. And I feel like when you get into entrepreneurship, that's a lot of what you feel. There's right. huge ups and downs, right? <laughs> on, but on over like time. A, a minute by minute basis. Absolutely. Like one text is awesome and four seconds later, another text pulls you right back down. Yeah. And it's so funny you say that because I, I would have to agree. And for the first time in probably at least six months over this past weekend, I had an ultra high. Yeah. Right. And it was so out of the norm. Like I'm jumping in the apartment, like, right. holy shit, this all came together. Like a lot of time going yeah. into this and, and the things played out, um, on an investment. And it was just like, damn, for me, this is like the first time I've been able to, right. to get into this part. So feeling that high that might be norm or a little bit more than the norm also reminds me of, I, I was like, wait, when did I feel this? When did I feel this last? It's something I know. And I can only compare it to like when I, I first got on got into entrepreneurship, right? right? Really, it's and like the most exciting high emotion, both high and low emotion moment of people's lives is like that first three to six months of really doing it, not thinking yeah. about doing it, but like the moment you take that leap and you're like, I run this company now, or I'm gonna drop out of school, or I'm gonna leave my job, or whatever that is, the emotions that you feel in that six months are ridiculous compared to, I mean, you and I have both been in this for a long time. I'm going on, you know, 10 years now. Um, I think, and that's probably more of it too, is I'm like used to the yeah. ups and downs. Um, but the more reps you get, and as long as throughout those reps, you're staying conscious of the feelings, you, you end up being, you know, rock solid. It starts to become a little bit like a superpower, right? right. And you're like, well, shit, this was, I, I didn't have this ability. You're a little all the too, time. People on my team, doing. we hire a lot of, you know, younger people, which is like crazy to say, cause I'm only 24, but like, you know, 20, 21 year old dudes and girls that like, yo, a Facebook account ad would get banned and yeah. they're texting me hysterical. Like, oh my goodness. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, we are supposed to get this ad out for company A, B or C and I'll go, it's okay. 
Like, what are we going to do? Text the founder and yeah. say, hey, it got banned. Like, they're not going to flinch either because they've been in it for so long. Um, and watching the progression of, of even team members and trying to be more of an example of that actively to them over the last two years, like, everyone can just calm down. Companies grow, companies die. It happens. It does not mean anything for your identity. It's an experience that you went through. And as long as you can remember that, life gets way more fun. Yes. And realizing those high highs and low lows are usually attributed to something that you haven't really experienced yet. Right. So as you get more, you get more reps and right. you experience a good sales call and then you have more reps and bad yeah. ones. And you have, it it you know, happens all the time to me. I used to be, when I was 17, running my first agency, so stoked to have gotten a $2,500 a month client. And now I will fire 2,500 a month clients because it doesn't mean anything, right? Like, and being, again, it's just being aware of yourself and watching that of like, signed a $10,000 a month client. I was like, dope, sent an email, let everyone know that that happened. And then like kind of went on with my day. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's literally, it's literally reps. It's reps plus attention on that emotional piece. And that's why you and I are friends is we, t we focus on that. Yeah. And I know a bunch of dudes that do extremely well that haven't gotten a grasp on their emotions. And more often than not, the impact of that is negative, right? Yeah. Partnerships fall through, things happen and they don't handle it the right way. Um, and because they weren't able to stay focused and like in line with their emotions, um, or their ego got involved, which is a whole nother topic that we can talk about. Um, yeah, just being, being attentive to that stuff within yourself. Right. Because it also, world. exactly. It also becomes the superpower because as you do the work internally, you start to see it in other people yeah. a lot quicker. Right. So that stability for me. And, and if there's three friends, you know, friend A started a company at 17 and it's killing it. Friend B went to business school thinking about starting one and then C hasn't even gotten started. I'm giving these archetypes because it, it I am naturally going to be a lot more attracted to the people that have stability in their life. And I can filter it pretty quick in conversations. It's not like I'm doing, it, it's happening automatically because right. of the work, because I, I can quickly notice like, oh shit, I remember that wasn't yep. even that long ago. Six months ago, I thought like that too. And I'm realizing that not every opportunity, Connor, I have to come in and coach, right? And a lot of times that can even hurt a relationship. Right. So it's just being aware of it and knowing we're all on our own paths. And 100%. the fun here is the conversation started with, what was the number one mistake we see millennials making today? Oh, we've and you only gone through, we only got through emotional one question so far. <laughs> but this is the beauty of it, I know. Right. And it all comes back to emotional intelligence and that it does become a superpower, but putting attention in this thing that a lot of people don't talk about, you don't need to meditate. There, yeah. There's so many different ways to, to tap into it. Now. We're going we're gonna to flip it because you were 17, 18 years old. You know, for the first three, four years of you and me knowing each other, along with Chris, the other uh, business partner at Uptown, we were on calls all the time. We were working and in, in, you were one of the first friendships that also was creating a business and we were all doing it and we cared. It seemed like we cared a little bit more about it and taking right. action than maybe some other people. So that's why we vibe, even though we didn't know each other in person. Now, at that time, you were doing partnerships like influencer partnerships, not with just small companies. Like when this influencer shit was popping off and I'm yeah. talking, I mean, I don't, how many years is this? This is what, six, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. This guy was working with McDonald's on huge campaigns, Coca-Cola. Like I have, we all have a lot of friends that do influential shit. This guy was doing it well before 20. And I look at you and that's why, I, I mean, every couple of years I'm just like, how old are you again? Yeah, how young right. are you? You're I like forget. 24. I le legitimately thought you were older than me. Yeah. Um, and I know we've had this conversation every multiple time. times. Yeah. Again, emotional intelligence, yep. it does magic. Now you had all of this going, when did you make, when and how did you make your first $1,000? My online. first thousand dollars. How did you make your first thousand? Yo, so everyone, well now, everyone's pretty familiar with drop shipping. Yeah. Um, you know, buying stuff on, on AliExpress or Alibaba, right? Mm -hmm. Shipping them, running Facebook ads, Shopify store. Um, one of the guys that actually runs a bunch of ads calls me the original drop shipper. But I did it on eBay where I would buy and sell iPhones. And this is iPhone 4s, right? Like back in the day. Um, essentially what I would do is I would list a bunch of iPhones on eBay um, at prices that were 20 to 40% above what they were actually going for. Um, back then, eBay had just introduced the buy now feature where it wasn't all auction based. Um, 
And so I started listing just buy nows because everyone was getting frustrated that they had to wait seven days for an auction to end to know if they were going to win this iPhone or not. When really, if they're buying an iPhone, they probably want it like immediately. They probably yeah. don't have a phone, they need whatever it is. Um, and so I list buy now um, offers on eBay for these iPhones and uh, people would buy them. And then I would go to the auctions that were ending within 24 hours buy them and set the shipping address for my order to the dude that had bought it from me. So you never touched the product? No. That's what yeah. dropshipping is. So I just kind of let that run after a while. I mean, made me a couple grand in eighth grade. It was a blast. It was like, I didn't know what I was doing, but it was fun. That would be like the first. How did you hear about thousand. this? Was it YouTube? Was it a book? I was, was it a to, I was trying to buy an iPhone on eBay and I got caught every time trying to fucking Sorry, I don't know if I can cuss. You can cuss if, you I, if I was trying to buy it, I couldn't get a new phone for like four weeks because I kept losing the auction unless I was like literally on eBay 24-7. And I was like, dude, why can't I just buy it now? And so then I just, then I finally got one and I was like, wait a sec. I wonder if other people are also struggling with this. And that was it. Damn. So. It's coming from a, a background in dropshipping too. <laughs> that scares me because that's tech. I know. That's tech. So you probably had some customer support stuff once you got to scale. But I don't know. Eighth grade, that's unreal. Though. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, we did not scale that very long. Probably a long. good thing. Yeah. Like but from then, I started understanding, all right, now I can do other things online. And it, it quickly transitioned to like, I was like one of the first, I was using Wix websites. Like I was building those fake Facebook pages for businesses, all that fun stuff. Um, and then a restaurant opened in LA and they needed a website and a Facebook page. And I was like, you can pay me a grand. And I, he was like, okay. And then he introduced me to a bunch of other people. Like I just got into the agency space at the right time with that, right? This was 2012. Like there weren't agencies right now. Everybody and their brother owns an agency, yeah. right? Like, li- like dude, my dog was like, yo, should I start an email marketing <laughs> agency this month? And I was like, to be honest, probably it's worth it, right? Like yeah. you might want to run that. There's a reason why, you know, like, and that's, that's what it is. Um, I've transitioned out of the agency model as much now. Um, but it's how I started. And I think it was good. It was like, I, I learned how to talk to people, sell, manage teams, um, and grow companies on the internet. And that has all of those skill sets now work extremely well for me in things that I run and own. I, I love that you share that. And damn, you're doing it at a young age, but you saw opportunity firsthand. Why? Again, because you were taking action, right? right? I mean, even though in that moment you were just looking to buy a phone a and phone, it was right. the, the pain point of like, oh shit, like it's going to be four weeks. Right. I couldn't imagine not having a phone for four weeks. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people too. Now to be able to see that and then take action on the opportunity. I think that's the difference that, that a lot of yeah. people aren't willing to, you can talk about it. And I did that for so long. I talked about all the shit I was right. going to do and I had long lists yeah. until I started focusing on like one, that was where you started seeing some growth and you start yeah. feeling this thing called fulfillment. Yeah. And then you want to start channeling things and emotional intelligence becomes a little bit more exciting because right. you're like, damn, this applies to how the team values me and right. how well we're going to communicate moving forward. Um, you have a handful of companies. You're a serial entrepreneur at 24 years old. And normally I wouldn't even say that, but I'm telling you like, just take my word on this and, and you'll be able to look into some of his content and see the, the work that he's been doing for some time. We haven't talked about your biggest failure. What would that failure be the, in, in the business? Um, Where'd you see an opportunity and, and what went wrong? Take us there. I, I don't necessarily think it was uh, an opportunity that was missed. Um, I mean, there's, there's been countless, right, opportunities that either I should have, uh, and I hate using that word, should, right, uh, but there was an opportunity for me to go and do X, Y, or Z. I didn't take action fast enough. I didn't commit to that thing at that time. Um, but I think, I think the biggest, and it's tough, failure is a, a weird word. Um, the piece that I've, I've struggled with the most um, is expectation setting um on a on a bunch of verticals um expectation setting with employees expectation setting with partners clients all of that um one of the reasons i'm able to do what i do is that i I like objectively i'm good at my job I, i do very well at growing companies on the internet um and a lot of people 
I didn't realize this, but a lot of people made the assumption that if I was involved, something would be successful. Um, and I didn't know how to say no, right? Like I'm, I'm good, but like, I'm not going to turn anything into a smasher success. Um, and so for clients, that was kind of it of like, you know, I have to say, Hey, like this product isn't proven. Like I know that I did this for this company that's similar, but you haven't sold through Facebook ads yet. Right? Like we should probably have a conversation about what this, this timeline actually looks like. You're not going to get thousand dollar days tomorrow. Like it just isn't how it works. Um, as much as we all want to believe that you can just flip a switch on Facebook and sales pour in, it's not how it works. Um, expectation setting with team. Um, it's weird, but I, I, you and I are similar. It's like we probably pretty much can get along with anyone and, and we're not scared of vulnerable conversations and we're willing to like share openly. And so a lot of people like and trust us because we're trusting and, and all of that. Um, but when people come in to work for me, uh, the challenge was always that I, I think that they always saw me as a friend first and not like their boss, um, which led to a lot of super awkward things when acquisitions were online, when all of the like when bigger plays were, were happening and people were like, wait, I don't own 50 percent of this business with you. And I go, no, like it was my idea. I did it like you helped on this piece, but like you don't just get you, you don't get equity for being in the room. Mm -hmm. um, you have to deliver value. If it was everyone in the room got equity, like again, dude, my dog would get equity, right? It's like, if that's the case, cool. Like put them in a little, little fund. Yeah. Um, but like that was, that was a big piece was expectation setting. And, and a lot of it was, you know, I, uh, I was always like the leader and the CEO. Um, and I had a hard time confronting those conversations because I was friends with them also. Um, and so I ended up bringing in a COO and a CFO who now kind of serve as the people that come into our ecosystem work with me, but they work for those two. And it helped kind of create a different dynamic of like, even if I was holding like my friend accountable versus somebody's boss holding them accountable, that dynamic, just, just the context of that relationship, um, is something that I've been working on a lot in the last six months. Uh, Cause we do a lot. We start a lot of businesses. We partner with a lot of people. Like there's so much going on that managing expectations in those relationships is probably, has probably hurt me and my companies the most in the last five years. And something that we're super active about correcting and, and addressing right now. You just spoke on so many things. I mean, th that is, Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and I wouldn't have had this thought even coming into it. I realized it on the sales side. Absolutely. And in, in the business owning side, it, it's so important in every area of life with relationships, yep. with your significant other. It's very important to set expectations correctly. And I catch myself and I've always been an energetic person. Right. And then in that moment, feeling the energy and, and you might the challenge that I caught myself doing was over promising early on. Oh yep. yeah, we can do that. Yeah. I know we can cause we've done it in the past. Right. And then with a company, you have systems in place and you have management for a reason. We did the exact same thing when we brought yeah. in uh, fractional decision makers and or whatever degree that helped the separation a ton. Yep. And it also helped me personally so that I wasn't feeling like I'm looking to, to give free handouts to friends yeah. and friends started to respect me more. Yep. Right. And that was, I didn't, I didn't believe that was going to, I thought they would look at me and go, Connor, you know, we've always been boys. How are you not going to, you right. know, help me out here? And it's like, to tell you the truth, business school taught me one thing. And one of those takeaways in that is like, I really don't want to necessarily get into business with family right. or really close friends simply because I value that relationship so right. much in, in the right context, in the right context or family. Right. Absolutely. And now do we both work with some friends? Absolutely. But it's because of expectation setting and I had this conversation with someone two weeks ago, uh, a new client that came in through a referral. Um, awesome person. Going to see him here in a few days. It sounds like you guys will be at the event too. Because it came through me and a, a friend of friend, it wasn't a current client or something, right. introduced me and then it came together. 
I was the one getting the customer support messages, yeah, the emails, text, and the, the thing emails, is, is all of it. Yeah. it was rephrasing and helping him understand. It's not. I, I can't position it as yeah. no. I'm looking to do less work. No, we have systems in place yeah. and management, and I want to make sure that yeah, your questions are addressed as quickly as possible by I, the right person. It happens literally all the time.